All right. Well, why don't we why don't we get started? Um, sure. So thank you everyone for coming to our, our Zoom cocktail hour tonight. Um, I'm Emily from Green Apple Books. Um, we have both Tess Taylor and Daniel Harris books, as well as all the poetry they're going to be recommending on our website at greenapplebooks.com, just on the front page. Uh, so I'd encourage everyone to go there, check out their books, and please order them. Um, do, <laughs> so Daniel Handler is the author of seven novels, including Bottle Grove. As Lemony Snicket, he is responsible for numerous books for children. His books have sold more than 70 million copies and have been translated into 40 languages and have been adapted for screen and stage. Tess Taylor's work has appeared in The Atlantic, The Kenyan Review, Poetry, Tin House, The Times Literary Supplement, CNN, and The New York Times, among others. And she's received awards and fellowships from McDowell, Headland Center for the Arts, and the International Center for Jefferson Studies. Taylor is also the on-air poetry reviewer for NPR's All Things Considered. Uh, she's the author of Misremembered World, The Forge House, Working Days, and tonight, uh, in addition to drinking cocktails, she'll be discussing her two new books of poems, Last West and Rift Zone. So thank you, everyone, for coming. Hello, and thanks to Emily from Green Apple Books. Thanks to all the nice folks at Green Apple Books. Oh, look, there it is. How we miss it. No, we miss it so much. Yeah. Um, true story. I ordered some books at Green Apple Books, and some of them were not available from the distributor. But Pete of Green Apple Books knew that they were there in the store, and he went into the store and got them for me so he could send them to me. Wow. So support your local independent bookstore because they are lovely and powerful, and they can't wait for your support. So how are you doing, Tess Taylor? I'm good, I'm good. I am so yeah. excited. I hear that there's a cocktail called the Rift Zone. This, there is. There, there, were many things, there were many things that was going to make this event wonderful, but I was very intrigued. And I actually have all the ingredients here, but I have not yet made this cocktail. So I'm really interested to learn what could it be? Uh, well, I'm glad. I, um, I assume that everyone who is watching has their own cocktail kit and every possible ingredient available so they can all make it along with me. So first, take your beautiful cocktail stirrer. I just have a glass. There. Um, then take some gin. I like to use Monkey 47 gin. You're using- I have gum shampoo. Gum powder, yeah. Um, that's a good gin too. So you put three measures of gin. Oh! Whoa, this is very intense. Yeah, I went to a bunch of bars today and all of the open bars in San Francisco are serving this cocktail nonstop. They are crazy about the Rift Zone because they're the so Rift excited Zone? about okay. Taylor's new book that they're all doing it. Every single bar that's open in San Francisco today is serving this cocktail. I have all of the bars. I love it. All the bars that are open. That all is a big subject. Obviously, the bars that are closed are not serving oh, it. I know. Here. Then take, which I'm sure everyone in the audience has close at hand, some poppy liqueur. I thought would be nice. I thought would be nice because the California poppy is the uh, state flower, and um, Tess Taylor's book Riftstone is all about California, which we're going to discuss. So even and though it's a and little this is made in the city of angels, this is literally poppy yeah. liqueur. It's amaro, which is kind of an Italian bitter. But it's right. made of poppies here in California. I love that. Mm, so put just a little half measure in. Half measure. OK. And then, just to keep it out, take some white wine that you have lying around the house. It should be Californian white wine to be totally proper, but I just happened to whatever. I just picked what I have lying around the house because these are desperate times. I think mine is French. Is that going to be OK? Yeah, you'll be fine. Good. Good. Um, and then put another half measure in there. And then take your elegant long spoon with a beautiful swirly section. Ooh. I have a toothpick. But, you know, yeah, you're not touching sure. yeah, It's good. I find wow. that cocktails are like poetry and that they can be very elegantly constructed or you can just throw them together. Both work. Right. right. Both, in fact, yeah. Right? Mm. There's a poem that you work on for five years and there's a poem that you wrote in 20 seconds. They're both fine. And then you can pour it into a glass with a little slice of lemon, maybe from the Meyer lemon tree in your backyard. Because we're in California with our lemon trees. Yeah. 
And in my fantasy, it was going to end up being kind of the shade of a California poppy, which isn't quite, but it's like a baby California poppy. Mine is like a, a delicious pale yellow. Yeah. Yeah, and I didn't have, I don't have lemons right at this place, but you know what? Let's just, let's just, let's just drink. I agree. Yes, let's I agree. Drink, let's just let's drink. Let's drink to California, which has a, an amazing, so let's drink to um, a state that is keeping us safe at this moment. Amen. Amen to that state. All right. Well, um, I want to talk about both of your books, but I'm going to talk about Rift Zone first. Um, and one thing that I've always admired about your poetry, well, two things about in general, your entire poet, poetic presence is that you seem to me um, to work very quickly. You're a very prolific poet. And I think that your poetry has a lightness and a swiftness that goes with being prolific. And that's exciting to me. I also write too much. So I know how that feels. And sometimes there's some writers who write too much and it feels like an endless, like everything gets thick as molasses and you keep this light swift. It's, a, it's like, you're like a, the bike messenger of the poetry scene. So I appreciate it. And then also it seems, and I wanna, this is my first question to you. I read from your poetry that you have kind of a commitment to accessibility, right? These are poems that do not make you furrow and frown by meeting something that seems like obtuse or opaque. It seems like they're very open and welcoming poems. And I wondered if that's like a commitment that you have in your head or if that's just my own um, half tipsy interpretation. Um, I'll drink to that. Yeah. I don't think it's necessary. Accessibility sounds like the wrong word. One of the things that I think about a poem is that it should interrupt you with a very compelling speaker, right? Like the rhyme of the ancient mariner, you're like suddenly just being addressed by this crazy person who's, you know, going to tell you the story of the albatross, but you're going to listen to them. And the feeling that there's a silence before and then there's the feeling of being spoken to or with. And maybe the speech is weird, like a dog addresses a man or the state of Vermont is giving a soliloquy. Like these are actually just examples I was thinking of today with my students. But the feeling that there is a speaker and a spoken to, that feels really important to me. And I guess uh, in my San Francisco life, in growing up here, I trained as a singer in the San Francisco Girls Chorus. and I this feeling that you are going to be somehow living in the music of words is really important to me. So it's not accessibility as much as maybe music and presence. Those things feel like critical. That makes sense to me. Yeah. I guess I meant um, accessible as opposed to difficult. And I think, um, and maybe, maybe accessible is still the wrong word, but I think that, um, it's always difficult to talk about literature that's easy to love in terms that don't sound condescending. Because no matter how you try to talk about it, there seems to be a hierarchy where the best literature is obviously something that's completely incomprehensible and the worst literature is something that you love immediately. And that's no one's experience of literature. No one feels that way. And, and all so I'm gonna say from that is I think that you love me immediately. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so there's a lot of autobiography here, and I want to talk to you about California upbringing. Um, you know, I was in the San Francisco Boys Chorus. Yeah, I know that's we. I, and we we were quite. Yeah, where I mean, we are, we are, in many ways I think had very similar or, or at least parallel childhoods. Yeah. What do you find, like when you explain to when people say, "Oh, you grew up in California," how is that? What do you say? Um, I grew up in a sort of funny little in -burb that when I grew up was working class and a little bit, um, looked down upon. And then when I went to the East Coast and I just said its Spanish name to everyone on the East Coast, nobody could decode it. They didn't know if it was rich or poor. They didn't know what it was. It was, it was given a pass. Um, people who'd gone to Exeter and Andover, um, people nobody knew what it was to be from California. And I think that was the moment when I started thinking, what is it to be from California? 
And I left with this vague jumble of images and I lived on the East Coast. Um, and then I came back to the West Coast right before I had a baby and I moved into the same town that I grew up in. And it had changed and I had changed. And I think this, um, this sense of longing for the past and remembering a childhood, but also rereading the childhood and thinking that you, the state, everything has changed beneath the surface um, or on the surface was kind of, kind right. of the first impulse, right. Okay, and then w was your childhood, um, I mean, one of the things that I think about growing up in California is that I took for granted a lot of things that I thought were normal aspects of childhood. I think yeah. to some extent everybody does this, right? However you grew up is the normal way to grow up and you don't learn how unusual it is for whatever reason um, until you begin to move through the world. But um, the things that I feel that I took most for granted were kind of um, a social justice sensibility and super delicious food. Those were two things that I thought kind of everybody had. And it wasn't until I left their orbit that I realized how unusual both those things are, certainly in the United States. And were there things like that for you? Like, was there something that you thought was normal that turns out to be quite special about growing up in California? I mean, Contra Costa County, where I grew up, has um, been one of the most diverse counties in the country since about 1985. So, um, you know, in terms of the demographics, the sense that the world was a very, very diverse world and that people were arriving from everywhere that we lived at the end of multiple trade routes, that, yeah, and delicious food and delicious conversation and that went with that, um, that felt sort of like I was shocked to realize how that wasn't true everywhere. Um, I remember when I got to my very preppy college on the East Coast, which I sort of felt like I needed to take on as an education to myself as a Berkeley kid, that I was really shocked when people wore the J. Crew catalog unironically. I thought, yeah. I thought, <laughs> and then, oh, you wanted to wear that on purpose. <laughs> yeah. and that was this funny kind of thing of just that there were these, there was some other hierarchy that by which the world operated that I hadn't yet learned to read. And I think um, I had a sort of wayward teenage years. There's a lot of like waywardness in my poems and um, just cutting class with my friend Caitlin to like uh, smoke pot on the beach. You know, who, who cuts AP chemistry to smoke pot on the beach except the California kid? Maybe we all, I don't know, maybe we all do, but it just, it just felt like a, a kind of a, a beautiful abandon. And, the Bay Area was very expensive, but it wasn't quite like this. There was something, yeah. the internet didn't exist quite yet. And to be at the far end of the colony and to the far end of this American project and in the sunshine and, and a little bit in this sort of mis mysterious glow of the lemon trees. I don't know. It was a, it was a beautiful time in a way. And um, one thing that your collection takes on a lot, I think, um, that is very powerful in California that I, again, I don't think you, t you learned it until you were an adult, is the really deep kind of cultural and political amnesia that California has. I mean, yeah. America in general, I think, has trouble facing up to all kinds of um, atrocities of the past. But um, I think California in particular has just had a wide, long history of like, you come here and there has never been anything here. And not just, um, for indigenous peoples and the early settlers, but kind of over and over and over again to make that imprint of it. And I really like that your book, um, both, I mean, it, it delves into the past, but it also delves into the amnesia. Like it delves into not knowing what's happening. Um, and that's something happening? What's going on? Okay. Can you hear me? <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> Something happened in the middle of the cultural media. Oh, okay. That, my friends, is live. That's liveness. Liveness is this weird thing that we're living with now. Like, yeah. I watched the New Yorker writer talk about the process of reporting an incredibly important piece, but in the middle, 
she was desperate to get some groceries delivered by DoorDash. And she, you know, she had to run out in the middle of this presentation. So anyway, <laughs> apparently dinner is being cooked in my house, but the fire, uh, the fire alarm went off. So, All right. you know, um, that All was right. just, Kind of like early just, Sonic Youth. That's what it sounded like. Maybe Sonic Youth was rewriting in your basement. Yeah, well, actually, I do. I do live on this block um, where uh, Queens Clearwater started. All so, right. Um, and I live um, uh, in this town where Green Day started, so it's funny. But, you know, in, in some ways, I grew up feeling like the town that I grew up in was a little bit boring and suburban and kind of like, uh, just, I just, there wasn't much to hold me here. So the shock of coming back to it all these years later felt um, like Berkeley was better and San Francisco was way better and New York was way, way better. That was how I thought. And to come back here and to realize that this place has this really interesting and painful history that is its own microcosm of American history, that I'm sitting on the seat of a Spanish land grant, and then, and then that was Ohlone, and then it was Spanish, and then it was Mexican, and then there was this land grab at right here in this town, this crazy protracted battle for, um, for a piece of property, and then in the end, there was this other crazy thing that happened that this beautiful adobe that was at the center of the town got torn down to make a really, really boring mall called the, the El Cerrito Plaza, which, you know, it then got knocked down because it itself was sort of like crumbling and now there's an even boxier mall there. And this, like, underneath the mall is this tiny stream and the stream has this voice that fills up in, this, in the winters and it's like this tiny last trace of a landscape um and i don't I, I think it was just learning to name the violence of that in my own backyard ecologically and historically um that felt it felt important it felt important to say actually this is very in interesting this is sort of interesting because this is this is a little microcosm of an american violence you know Right. But at a funny angle, like through through Spain and Mexico, my backyard has belonged to four different, you know, groups of people in the last 250 years. And to just hold that all the time as a, just a knowledge of living on the surface of the earth and the reality that you live in, but also to live with this other kind of like these seismic layers of history. Right. Yeah. And was that um, parallel to the kind of excavation of your own adolescence and childhood that you were doing in these poems? Um, I mean, I should say that many of your previous collections to me embody, you're going out and finding something. You go somewhere and you look around and things are happening. And I feel like this was a very um, much more internal and um, uh, less about going out into the world and more about just looking around immediately at you and what had happened to your own past. And do you feel those kind of political excavations are parallel to your childhood excavations or are they two different things? Well, I think that it's true that I wrote these books when I had small children in the suburbs. That I grew up in. <laughs> and, and I, there wasn't a, I mean, it's very much like now. In fact, I think these days are very much like the postpartum days where we don't know what's going to happen and we're just kind of stranded and we're like waiting for time to pass. And when, when you have a newborn, you know, your life gets very small. You sort of like are very lucky to get the laundry closer to the washing machine and you're lo lucky to get a few steps out the door. And so the thing that I could go and walk in was this graveyard that's kind of in my backyard and it has names that come from everywhere all over the world. It's probably the most, it's not very haunted, but it is incredibly diverse. It starts in 1910 maybe. And then there's some bones that are transported obviously through the gold rush. And so one person who was like a civil war soldier, but like also really, um, memorials to Japanese internment are there, people who were interned and, and names, names, I think the entire globe of names is in this graveyard and they're all recent and it feels so new. So this feeling of, of kind of thinking about like what converges in this place. Um, but I think part of that in, the impetus for writing that was just the initial sense of I am here and I am walking around this neighborhood and seeing it newly for the first time. And um, when you say you're walking around while you're working on your poems, are you literally writing when you go out and do these things? 
I'm learning so much about, I've been, I'm more and more fascinated with people's processes, not just artists, but all kinds of different things. And um, poets, it seems to me, have a wide diversity of uh, process. And so when you, when you say you're, that you're walking through a cemetery and this is beginning some poems for you, are you writing them on your hand or scraps of paper or recording them on your iPhone? Is that where you're doing the work or is that, are you just kind of immersing yourself and later you sit down and it comes? Yeah, I do. I did have a series of things that I would record into my audio, my voice notes right after, especially when I had a baby strapped to my chest and I had no hands at all. I would just record a voice note. Um, I, I think of right, starting a poem as a kind of overhearing, that you overhear a possibility in the mind's voice. And the, the voice of the mind or the strangeness that ap ap appears in the mind is like a little tear in the fabric of the day. And if you're feeling brave, you can listen to it. And if you're feeling brave, you can write it down. And then you don't really have to know exactly what it's becoming. But it became clear to me very soon that there was some constellation of concern about California that I wanted to write about, that it was hyper-modern and also super ancient, that um, it felt radically new and perched in this precarious place and yet also is home to these like 2,000-year-old redwood trees that we have mostly destroyed. And there was some sort of paradox here that felt like the paradox. And I, I, I didn't have settled what it was yet. I just was trying to overhear, there was some conversation or dialogue in the mind that I was having the pleasure of overhearing. So I think of that, you know, it's not exactly like you're taking dictation when you write a poem, but that right. sense that you're, that you're open, open to that argument in your head is a really, a really good place to start. Um, yeah, I love that. That phrase, constellation of concern, seems um, so appropriate, not only to art making, but kind of our own internal processes, right? Like. I mean, for most of us at this moment, I think we're in a constellation of concern where there's like a couple of really big stars in the constellation. Oh, but not the only ones. I mean, I think it's, there's something um, I always think fascinating about the kind of human mind and soul that um, we can be, be very concerned about enormous things that are really affecting a lot of people, but it will really compete with our own personal discomfort and our own tiny little stories and concerns too. So constellation of concern, that's gonna be my new, um, I was gonna say mantra, but I have a real mantra, so I'm not gonna mess with the mantra. Um, what, will you read a couple now? I think this is a good, uh, read a couple from Rift Zone now, and then we'll talk sure, about sure. other poetry and we'll get drunker and drunker, it'll be fun. Okay. So here's a childhood memory, um, elementary school, where I went to school and where I sent my son and where I live, right around the corner. I live around the corner from this school. This is 1988, and the thing I wanted to say before I read this poem is that the Stockton massacre had just happened, and it was the first very big shooting at a school in 1988. And that is how long we've been wondering whether we should do something about all this. Sixth grade, 1988. No one explained the reasons Dana found that spring to bring her brother's gun to school. Triggers that led her to threaten to shoot you bitches. We were nubbly by the morning glories, hadn't scattered different ways. We were playing tetherball. I remember Sierra Birch's thin legs running, a shrill voice yelling, call the teacher. In high noon, California sun, Dana's palm was shaking, her face tight with fear or anger. In dream time, big men came to cuff her, and I heard her whimper, saw her lean girl's body fall. This year, I found a photograph, Dana and her friend Manon, mug for my frame. Mischievous grins, split baby cheeks, ponytails bustle in the wind. It came back like a rusty fountain, a smell of chalk and sixth grade funk. We were learning fractions. That day we watched her disappear, heard the big door shut, 
the silence after. Decades floated over all our bodies. All the schools have drills for guns now. None of this names how it feels to look back 30 years and find this odd remainder. Bright and on the verge of life as if we are yet unhurt. There's Dana smiling. That was one of the many poems of Rift Zone I have marked with my beautiful post-its. Um, so while Tess finds another poem, I should say that um, greenapplebooks.com will happily send you a copy of Rift Zone. And uh, uh, it is a book, I think for, I'm assuming that most people logging in are Californians. And um, I think right now when we feel in many ways proud of ourselves as Californians compared to um, so much of the other uh, responses to our current situation, um, Riftstone will make you proud and ashamed to be from California both and um, really grapples so elegantly with many of the contradictions and um, extremities that are happening in the Golden State. He says, taking another sip of the Rift Zone cocktail available at any bar near you that's open, which is none of them. But I wanted to say that I haven't said is that it's really good. I haven't said Daniel, like you invented, Daniel invented the Rift Zone cocktail. May, long may it live. It is quite delicious. Thank you very much. I look forward to having one with you in person when we're all, uh, you know, free to leave. I know, free to leave. Um, I thought I would read um, one called Song with Shag, Rug, and Wood Paneling. Yes, please. Everybody remember their shag rugs? Everybody remember that weird cottage cheese ceiling that was like present in the 80s with the glitter? That strange... Um, weird and it would it turned out to be made of asbestos those crazy those ceilings if you don't yeah. remember that's cool but um yeah they were they were a thing i've um, always been curious, i've actually always been curious about this and i meant to look i literally meant to look it up before this event and i couldn't look it up because i have the oed right behind me so maybe i will while you read but i'm very interested in if shag carpeting and like shagging is that the same shag because when I, I don't remember when I learned the British expression shag, but I was like, early high school would be my guess from reading a British novel. And that um, I was like, a shag, like do you shag on a shag rug? Is that what a shag rug is for? Maybe, like, maybe that's what it's for. Like, and then when I walk in and someone's like, oh, I have a shag rug. I'm like, I know what that's for. Is that what that means? Or are those totally different words? Yeah. Well, anyway, this is just, this is just uh, for the 1980s. Yes. Song with shag rug and wood paneling. My parents renovated that old home. It is clean as a lobotomy. The cracked linoleums erased. New hardwood floors are gleaming. Gone are gold shag rugs, the shade of California August, on which I lay beneath the dust moat, studying the drift of genome, species, phyla. Gone the shameful faux wood paneling, dark embarrassment of my teenage years. They've added a back door to the kitchen where night after night I fought with my mother. I who spent a decade sending hatred towards a glittering asbestos ceiling have only a distant dump to hate, the settling of old carcinogens. My ancient vehemence is confounded by brightly lit new silence, emptiness beneath the open vaulting. Yeah. Um, right, even there you see in the remodeling, you see that transformation of California that is um, both individual and uh, general in this book. You gonna read one more? Are you gonna give us one more? Yeah. One, um, more. one more. I can see that all the participants are doing this. I know, well look, I, I, hi participants. Well, thank you for coming. Yeah, um, and um, feel free to um, ask questions. Um, charmingly, most of the questions so far are not really questions, but are people from California who knew us both, knew one or the other of us, getting in touch, so that's very charming. There's a San Francisco uh, Boys Chorus alumni, Daniel Potas. Hey, Daniel, I haven't seen you since we were kids. 
Um, and Denise Martinez is, uh, has things to say about Amherst. It's very charming. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. Um, I want to read two more short poems, if that's okay. No, yeah, first. So I live in a town that was literally a ground zero for Japanese internment. El Cerrito is right by the Richmond shipyards. The Richmond shipyards became such a place where they were building the ships. Um, and also as it became a center of the wartime effort, the idea that you would evacuate people who were perceived as a threat was a big deal. And for complicated reasons, there was a really big Japanese American population in El Cerrito in the 40s partly because the land had been so hard to buy because it was in this weird land grant stage of like being grabbed from Mexican Americans. So it's like- Yeah, it's and, and I didn't know that Japanese internment was so much about land grabs until recently, which is super fascinating that- um, Yeah, this entire, my entire town is like little ugliness upon little ugliness, like twisted. But um, there was a, there was a town, a house that had actually been saved by one somebody's white neighbor and then people had moved back into it and then there was a talk of making it into a museum and in the end it got torn down this a few years ago to make a um a senior center and there's again in true commemorative fashion like a tiny plaque to the fact that it was these people's house but i had the really interesting fortune of getting to go visit it in sort of its final days and somebody opened a door that they shouldn't you know not shouldn't but like somebody let me in in a way that was very generous so that I wrote this poem. Um, raw notes for a poem not yet written. And one thing in this poem, some of the words are struck out, but yeah. they're also there. And I want you to just imagine as readers that the word is there and not there at the same time, that it's hovering in a confusing space of being there and not there. It's a ghost word. Raw notes for a poem not yet written. I walk by the Japanese ruins gated behind cracked pavement lot where the bare hills, a riot of poppies frame little sh wild lupin, geranium, hothouse thorns. They never came back. Their white neighbors saved not all of their business. In the windows, torn rice paper, half a Shinto shrine, 60 years later toppled where they were taken, last of those buildings down in, oh, my town. We perch on what was done here. My best friend's grandmother, my first boyfriend's grandmother, I knew it later, they never spoke of it to me. Whiskey crates and damp mold of abandoned places. Coyote bush rattles seems to be asking, when will they come next? When are they coming? Um, that is a terrific poem. And I was curious, this was on my um, list of too many nerdy questions, but the, so this poem is, um, the title is Raw Notes from a Poem Not uh, Yet Written. And then also there's this crossing and crossing out. And so you really kind of let us into the process of making the poem when you're in this um, space that's been in transition and been so battled over. And was that, did that come naturally to you? Or was that a structure and a um, gambit that you, that, that took a while to grapple with? Well, Again, sometimes I think in constellations, and so there'll be this sense that there should be a poem about this, or something will happen here, and sometimes that'll that'll just be like a title or an idea. Um, uh, right now, I have a title called "My Son Teaches Himself to Play Amazing Grace." Whether or not that's actually a title or actually will become a poem, I don't know. But this idea, like le recently within. Um, within this moment, my son, who's very, very good on the violin, but also good with the ear, has picked up this kind of crazy fingering for Amazing Grace, and it's, it howls. And the sense of like him picking up my grace notes and the, the way that he's heard the way I sing it, and he's playing it away, and I'm passed on a song, and it's in my mind. I don't know if that's a poem or not a poem, but it feels like it might be a poem. And similarly, this feeling of seeing this house just at the last moment, getting to go behind the barbed wire and the um, chain link fence and see this house before it was torn down. And to finally for the, I've been passing it my whole life, but to finally for the first time know how to see it for what it was, 
or to see this story in it. Um, and I had it in my notebook for a long time, write that poem, write that poem. And finally, I went, just went back to the notes that I had for the day that I went there. And I just thought, okay, write down these notes and then write down even your strikeouts. And then I thought, I like this. This is, this yeah. is what I mean to say. I mean to say this. I mean to say, I, this is what I was trying. I mean, it's just a, it, the, the feeling of it being raw and attempting was okay with me. But it's one of those interesting ones because it in some ways took 10 minutes to write and in some, when it's, in some ways took like 10 years right. of, of thinking I'm going to write it in a more full way. But this way is actually probably more true. And did you feel um, self-conscious about putting a poem in here that was in such a raw state? Like, did you feel like you, were you tempted to um, fix it? Or, or do you feel, are you enough of an artist now that you feel comfortable with the, um, with the kind of uh, tossed off or in transition aspect of it? I think, I think sometimes when something's been thought about a long time, the thing that emerges and bubbles to the top is a true bubble. And, you know, like if you cook pancakes or you make bread, like finally when the bubbles come up, they've actually like absorbed all the gases of the process, yeah. you know? So the bubble at the end could be quick if it, if you will. And um, I also think that poems in a book exist in relation to other poems. That, that I always think of books as kind of a big collage, which is another form I like to work in. Like personally, I love to cut things up and, you know, paste them down. So the feeling like this was a collage book was good. And this, co this piece felt like it anchored something. All right. Um, oh, sorry. So one more. I can do this all day. Right? No, I love, I'm having so much fun talking to you. And um, we have so much to talk about. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, no, I mean it. Like, I, I, we just, I've had, Dan and I met years ago, and, and we do have this background as sort of singers, and I think we remember the Bay Area that was, and, um, you know, obviously there's a million Bay Areas to remember, but um, it's nice to do that. I wanted to just write a, read a tectonic plate poem, because this book really is about earthquakes and about yeah. the fact that even when we stand on the surface of the earth and it feels stable, actually underneath us where we stand, the world is pushing against each other. And in light of all of these moments, I've kept thinking, you know, the, the pressure is constant, but the rupture feels sudden. And that's maybe why I wrote about rift zone, because we're living in this moment where all of these things feel sudden. And yet in the same way, they're also the pressure is always there. Right. We've lived with virus and for it. What do they say in Hemingway? Like, I went bankrupt two ways gradually and then suddenly, right? It's that. But yeah, all at once, right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah I went. And, and so that feel, it's exactly this dichotomy of like, this was here and it wasn't here. This was here and it wasn't here. Um, and I know. feel obliged to add that so many people I know, um, including myself, in the current situation of the pandemic, are like dipping into the emergency earthquake food. Right. It's just exactly. a funny thing of like, well, there can't be an earthquake now because we're dealing with something else. And it's like, that's not really how earthquakes work. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we're saving, honestly, everybody save your masks because you might need them in October. Right? Like that's the other yeah. side of it. It's true. Two is, you know, um, what pre-existing conditions does this, does this uh, pandemic expose? And I think, I think, one thing that we need to all be taking to heart is that we were all living with a lot of pre-existing conditions. And yeah. I think all of these pandemics, whatever you're going to call the pandemic, all of these earthquakes are partly because the pressure was constant and the rupture is set in. So I'm going to read a poem, but rift zone is actually the land opened up by the, by the tearing between the plates. And I'm going to read a, a, an earthquake poem and that will be, a good way to send this out. And um, then we can answer these four questions that are patiently waiting for our, from our visitors. We got, a, I mean, we got a lot, we got a, we got to get through it. Yeah. I know, we got a lot. Okay. We're not messing around here. This is poetry. I know, this is etymology with tectonic plates. Fault line we say, and what is this but tendril to fault, to foul, a falling short, a failing, to blame or blemish, e.g. a damaged place. 
the world also making visible, at least in part, the unimaginable moving plate. Earth skull where it buckles to trip, to falter, err or blunder, boundary in continuity or stone. Fault, we say, hiking shirt and basalt, cracked seafloor under fog. Two, later I rework these lines, chart lost Pangeas, worlds emerging at the brink, or try to sort the crevices of mind. To sort what rubble all the shift made visible, linen, thread, or cord, also the spool or snare, the mark or stroke or way of making there the stave, to order, to trace, especially a band or furrow, to measure of a verse or hymn, to bound, to limb, to lineate a song in a harsh climate, to crack, to realign. Uh-huh. I'm gonna drink uh, water now, Dan, because your riff tone was potent, man. Um, it is, yeah. And particularly when you when uh you said we all have pre-existing conditions, I took like a sizable sip. Yeah, pre yeah. yeah, all the pre existing I'm, I'm a little outside the comfort zone of hosting someone, quite frankly. Um so I know we both brought books by other poets that we want to talk about a little bit. Um, but I also wanted to talk about this project that you did with MoMA. Yeah. And, you know, in, an, in another parallel, you and I have both done projects with MoMA. Um, and that's strange to me, too. So uh, talk a little bit about Last West, which is available at greenapplebooks.com, incidentally. Yes. Um, if we're Californians, and we are, I think, in some ways, all of us Californians, we want to remember that Dorothea Lang was one of our founding mothers. I realize I, I'm going to just turn. Hold on. Oh. oh. What's happening? What's going on? Nothing. You know, I thought I had an opened one. These come wrapped in plastic, but it's not. This one isn't open. So I'm going to talk to you about it. Dorothea Lang, Dorothea Lang is one of our amazing uh, Californian godmothers. And, you know, she showed up here in 1926 and she opened a portrait studio and she photographed the wealthiest people. She photographed the Levi Strauss family and she photographed, you know, um, the people that were making San Francisco money. And then when the Great Depression hit, she looked outside her window and she realized that she wanted to do something else. And she began to photograph the streets and then she fell in love with Paul Taylor who was photographing or was doing work around migrant labor. And she went on the road with him and suddenly she was in the midst of photographing people arriving out of the Dust Bowl, but also the conditions of agricultural laborers are in California, which are amazing things. And yeah. she got a job with the Farm Security Administration. And one thing I wanna to say to everybody listening and to anybody who will listen to me is that the New Deal included artists because it was important that artists write down what was happening and make images of what was happening and that artists build murals for post offices and artists, artists build beautiful um, sculptures. And so artists were part of the New Deal. And as we begin to think about how to rebuild the economy, I just want to point out that Dorothea Lang is an example of an artist who was funded by the government and made something incredible. And she traveled around California and she photographed, artists, um, she photographed people in tents. Uh, living at the edges of fields, and she photographed the conditions of California in the 1930s. And eventually, she got a weird job with the far, with the office of the war, and she ended up photographing Japanese internment, which was super creepy because then it was confiscated from her. Um, one of the things she photographed was El Cerrito, California, which is where I grew up. And so she's been in my head for a long time as a really interesting artistic godmother. And two or three years ago, I started going to the Oakland Museum of California Archive, and I fell in love not just with her photographs, but with her notes. And I ended up using her notebooks to follow her drives around California. And I drove all these places that she'd seen, like Nipomo, where she photographed Migrant Mother, and like Imperial Valley, where she photographed carrot pickers in 1934 and 1935, and basically every season through 1938. Yeah, I mean, you made a great road book out of this. Road book. Yeah. And, um... I have to say, obviously, everyone is going to purchase both Rift Zone and Last West because what are you crazy? But um, right now, at a time when uh, road trips are something that is not 
um, available to us. Um, this is a beautiful, beautiful book of moving through California, and I wholeheartedly recommend it. But um, as this you time say, last, yeah. this time last year I was on the road. This time last year I was somewhere between like I was in Davis and Woodford, and then I mean I was down in Imperial Valley. Like I drove around California. This 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 time last year I was driving around California. Um, I saw places where. Um, there are still not housing for agricultural laborers and there's also not homeless shelters. And I, I talked to a lot of people. I just tried to do some things that Dorothea Lang had done, which is just talk to people and put some notes in your back pocket. It wasn't very um, lofty, but I tried to explain to everybody why I was doing it. And part of the reason I was doing it was because Dorothea Lang had done it. And what I was amazed by is that everywhere across California, where I went, no matter if it was humble or grand, people seemed to remember that she had done an important service for that moment of the 1930s. And so I had beautiful conversations and I wove together what she had said and what was there. And sometimes the things were super weird, Dan, like there's a place where she photographs carrot pickers and literally on the side of that field is an internment center that holds 982 people. Yeah. And the, or, you know, right where in Nipomo, California, where she photographed a migrant mother, there is this crazy, crazy, crazy thing, which is a, a you know, a two, $1.2 million luxury estate, second home property thing. And it's called Monarch Dunes. So, you know, she, I think that even just going where she went and seeing it again was pretty weird and pretty emblematic somehow of California. Um, well, it's a beautiful book and I didn't, um, the time has slipped away from us in some ways that I didn't want to move on without um, paying homage to it because I think it's, um, well, anyway, it's, there's uh, photographs and maps and um, um, I mean, I mean uh, there's a diaristic sense to it as well as a poetic sense. And um, I just think particularly now when we're all trapped that it's just like a great little road thing. So pick, pick it up, Last West, there you go. Um, also, if you, you wanted to- Bump around California the way you wish you could, the way you wish you could get in your car right now and drive for three hours and eat a taco and drive for two hours and go somewhere else. I know, I miss it. Um, I wanted to say that if you wanted to have the experience of going to the Museum of Modern Art, which also you can't have right now, you can't jump on a plane and go to New York, the Museum of Modern Art is having this thing called Virtual Views this week, and they're pretty amazing, and this week is the week to devote to Dorothea Lange. And I also think this is, why not begin to remember what the New Deal was? We may yeah. be a million years away from it, but like, why not remember how many points of view it included and what an incredible thing it was to, to, to live with. Um, I, I mean, I hold high hopes for the deal that's coming. I mean, after all, our president wrote a book called The Art of the New Deal, right? So I mean, every, that's a full study of Dorothea Lang. So I think everything's gonna be fine. I wanna read you just one very, very, very short poem from- Yeah, Dorothea. give it to me, please. <laughs> So, so I may, just to give you a sense of what I did in this book, because I like used, I did travel and I wrote poems about the travel, but I also used her notebook. And this is, um, her notebooks were across 1934 to 1945. I, this is about a thousand pages, so very snippety. But I wrote a, a poem called Note to Self, and this is her notes to self as she's photographing. Note to Self, possible title to hold this soil. Note to Self. General theme of book, people left stranded by the outwash of industry in America. Note to self, US 99, the splendor and the rest of it. Note young trees, note poor man's canyon, a subject on the move. Note to self, really do the work, follow the whole travel, destination unknown, one, the method, two, this still blank a book on the conditions of us. There you go. Well, you have written a book on the condition of us, two books. Um, we're getting really on time to um, let everyone go. I know. Should we answer any of their questions? Are any of them good? 
Um, they are all, um, yeah, there's no, honestly, they're all people reaching out, which totally charms me, but um, I don't. No more questions. If anyone wants to ask a question, is it now? Yeah, I'm going to say so, one okay. thing. And we both recommended books. What do you, do? what do you got there? Okay. I think that you should read After Callimachus by Stephanie Burt. And the reason is, this is a campy translation of a Greek poet that no one remembers, but the Greek poet lives in a totally corrupt empire and is very sarcastic about it. And reading this will make you feel less alone living in your own corrupt empire. There we go. That's All right. right. Dan, you recommend one. Uh, I got uh, Mary Rufel. I mean... Uh, this new book is called Dunce, uh, just came out with Wave Books. It's by Maria Rufel, and I think she is, I'm just gonna, you know what, I gotta read just the first few lines of this book to give people a taste. I was swimming with the taste of apple in my mouth, a shred of apple skin between my teeth, I guess. It doesn't get any better than this, said the water. These are troubled times, said the shred. Yeah. one yeah it's so good yeah, um really great. I, also, I also think you were talking about accessibility and ellen bass come on man i know you know this woman ellen bass is just really at it as a poet and she's at it in a deep way and she's there in santa cruz hosting her workshops for you know many many years now and the thing is very, very little makes me slow down right now. My heart is going fast and it's hard to breathe. And I want to breathe. I'm a poet. I believe in breath. So I'm just going to read you a short poem. Yeah, please. Give it to us. Getting into bed on a December night when I slip beneath the quilt and fold into her warmth. I think we are like the pages of a love letter written 30 years ago that some aging God still reads each day. Then tucks it back into its envelope so much like sweet there's this book is sweet and full of love so um cool hi people who wanted to talk to us thank you for coming yeah, we're really for happy that you're here we really are and dan i could really um let's i can't wait to have a real cocktail with you in real person this has lifted my spirits immensely yeah we're going to we're going to have a rift zone party when all this is over so in the meantime, uh, go to greenapple.com to purchase the books that we've all talked about. And then also buy yourself some Poppy Amaro because we are here to stay. We're going to be drinking Rift Zones for the rest of our lives. Um, this is where I would say, like, give it up for Tess Taylor. And then everybody would be like, Woo! And then I would also sign your book. But also, if you want to find me on social media and DM me, I am actually signing and sending books to people. And the thing is, I enjoy signing them and then my children have the pleasure of walking them to the corner mailbox it is actually a ritual we do every friday oh. i really am enjoying the feeling of mailing things to people and you it know it's very yeah it's very tender right now so if that's something that you would like um be in yeah, touch hit her up dm her hit me <laughs> <laughs> all right Okay. Good night, everybody. Yeah. Mwah. Good night. Bye-bye.